Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Focus St. Louis uh, for this, uh, for joining us for this, uh, what I hope is a very interesting discussion. Um, last reminder, as you were entering the room, you were asked to participate in some audience polling by going to menti.com and entering the code. All of those are instructions are in the chat. So take a moment to do that. Before we get started, uh, I want to set a little background here. Uh, the St. Louis City Board of Aldermen and the St. Louis County Council have legislative oversight over roughly 1.2 million lives in the core of our metropolitan region. That means it's their job as the legislative arm of government to set the laws, which the executive arm then implements and the uh, judicial reviews. Before we get started, I wanna say the following. Legislating law is an incredibly difficult job. I believe it's particularly difficult in local government because legislation requires compromise and in local government, those compromises you're making are people's interests, people's preferences in the community where you shop. Uh, ask any local government leader in any sort of controversy how harrowing a trip to the local grocery store can be. But more importantly, it is an incredibly hard space to make decisions about how we weigh different values and different preferences and different populations off against each other in our great experiment of being a community, a diverse democracy together. So we need to support our electeds when they make the hard decisions in good faith, even if we don't agree with them. And we need to hold our electeds accountable to the promise and value, promises and values that they got elected on, because it's hard work and a huge responsibility. What other position pays you probably less than your administrative staff earns, requires you to publicly disclose your personal finances, be available 24 seven. And it's also guaranteed to make you persona non grata with at least half of the community that disagrees with your decisions. Leadership is hard. That said, over and above its usual difficulties, legislating local laws has recently seemed more fraught than usual. In the city, the Board of Aldermen is reopening a variety of questions thought to be settled, including the idea of having the number of aldermen by award reduction, including the idea of closing the workhouse. In fact, recent polling indicates that a supermajority of city residents, over 70%, no matter whether you're North, South, White, Black, male, female, progressive, uh, they, say, they say the city is on the quote, wrong track. All of this is happening in the city in the midst of an election for a mayor and in the face of a looming redistricting process that follows the census count every decade, as well as fundamental changes in how the city elects its leaders. In the county, with a quarter of the number of legislators representing three times the number of people and whose jurisdictions, unlike the city, include 90 different municipalities, there's a court case pending which, pending which may determine who is the rightful chair of the county council. This fight threatens to derail the important work of the council in the midst of a health crisis. How are we under to understand the working of these important bodies? What has brought us to this point? And what are the prospects for functional legislative governance in the region moving forward? Those are just some of the questions uh, we hope to answer today. To do that, uh, let me take a moment to introduce our illustrious panel in alphabetical order. So uh, I welcome to Mike Jones, who is the principal at Jones Strategic Advisors. He's also a former senior policy advisor to the county executive, a former chief of staff to the St. Louis City Mayor, as well as a member of the Missouri State Board of Education on the editorial board of the St. Louis American uh, and many other uh, titles too long to list here. Uh, so thank you, Mike, for joining us today. Uh, next, Rachel Lippman, news producer for St. Louis Public Radio covering, among other things, both the County Council and the City Board of Aldermen. 
Uh, she's a former State House reporter from both, uh, for both Michigan and Illinois Public Radio. Uh, very glad you could join us today, Rachel. Thanks for being here. Uh, next, Lashana Lewis, the CEO and founder of Lewis Consulting, president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association, former director of the St. Louis Equity and Entrepreneurship Collective, entrepreneur and citizen activist. Uh, very, very glad that you could join us, Lashana. Thanks for being here. And finally, last but not least, Tim O'Connell, associate at Brian Cave Law Firm, former chief of staff to the mayor of St. Louis, and also former legal counsel to the St. Louis Board of Aldermen, and former copy editor for the Post-Dispatch and the Washington Post. So you've done the journalistic and the legal side of this. Tim, thank you very much for joining us today. So we have two, uh, two kind of uh, pieces of the puzzle here. Uh, we have the county, uh, the county uh, council and the board of aldermen. And I, I want to go ahead and start with the county council. In order to jump into this issue a little bit, Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Can you give us your kind of objective reporting rundown on the current controversy that has the leadership of the county council uh, kind of in question? So I'm going to try not to take the entire meeting to do this. I just want to uh, thank Focus St. Louis and the other panelists uh, for this discussion. I think it is important. What happened here is uh, an election lame duck, essentially. Um, lame duck is a feature that we have in all legislative bodies. There was always a period between when an individual is elected and when their successor takes office where, you know, legislating either does or does not happen because lawmakers feel empowered to vote the way they want to uh, because they are, you know, no longer uh, answering to the voters anymore. What happened with St. Louis County is that the lame duck period extended longer than it normally would. There was a charter change passed by voters in August that changed the swearing in date to January 12th, 2021. And these were for new council members. It would not have been an issue had uh, Rochelle Walton Gray not lost in the Democratic primary in August and then had just, you know, a nominal Republican challenger in November, leading to Shalonda Webb becoming the new council member for the fourth district. I had to make sure not to say Ward because Ward is the city. Um, this is a North St. Louis ward. I don't remember all of the municipalities that it, or North St. Louis County ward. I don't remember all of the municipalities it takes in. The first meeting of the St. Louis County Council at which by charter they elect their leadership positions, chair and vice chair, was set for January 5th, 2021, which would have been a week before Shalonda Webb, this newly elected lawmaker, took uh, her seat. In a four to three vote where uh, the outgoing Rochelle Walton Gray was the tiebreaker, Lisa Clancy was elected chair of the board and uh, I believe it was Ernie Trakis was elected vice chair of the of the council. Excuse me, you can tell which one I cover more often than not. Uh, at the January 12th meeting after Shalonda Webb was sworn in, there was an effort from some members of the council to essentially attempt to undo that election, to put a resolution in that says we declare these results null and void because Councilwoman Gray was improperly serving her term and they got enough support to, quote, pass that resolution. There had been a legal opinion issued by the county councilor saying, no, you can't do this. You can't have this new election, but this resolution technically passed. They were not able to do a new leadership election at that particular meeting. Uh, they got themselves tied up into knots and adjourned after 30 minutes. The next Friday, those four members of the county council, that was Tim Fitch, uh, Ritter Heard Days, Mark Harder and Shalonda Webb called a special meeting to do this leadership election again. And under protest from the three remaining members, that would be Lisa Clancy, Kelly Dunaway, and Ernie Trakis, they purported to elect Rita Days and Tim Fitch as chair and vice chair of the St. Louis County Council. Who the lawful chair is, is now in court. Thank you very much. That, that was extremely helpful. Uh, good and clear. So since you ended on that question of things that are now in court, 
Uh, maybe I'm going to go to you next, Tim, and ask you, so what's at issue here? Uh, do you have any sense of what the arguments are, the issues are, and, and when we might expect some resolution on this? Sure thing. So uh, the first thing I would uh, mention, uh, which I think is important to keep in mind as we talk about legislative bodies in the, in the city and the county and legislative bodies in general, uh, is that you know, there's often a conflict of rules or a question about procedure, and then who do you go to? Um, in the city of St. Louis, the clerk, there, there's a position called clerk, who is technically the parliamentarian. Uh, and in the county, um, usually questions are often uh, posed to the county counselor, who is the official uh, lawyer for the, for the county. Um, really, uh, in both cases, it's up to uh, the actual members and the actual body itself to decide what the rules are. Uh, and uh, under parliamentary procedure, you need to have some kind of chair who's actually gaveling the meeting. Uh, that person uh, makes a, a ruling, and then there's an opportunity to uh, object, raise a point of order, and then maybe overturn that. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, I would often get this situation when I was the clerk. <laughs> And legal counsel for the board where somebody would say, well, what's your decision? And I would, I would have to make sure that the alderman understood. It's, you guys actually have to settle this in the meeting. I can tell you what the rules are, what the, what the, what the law, how it reads to me. But sometimes there's situations where it's ambiguous or there's a conflict and there's a choice to be made about what procedure you want to follow. Um, in this case, I think that writ large, uh, there's a couple of ways to look at the question. One is a conflict between uh, the sort of naked text of the charter as it stands now, sort of a quote, plain reading of the law as written, which you know now has this wrinkle that I'm not sure anybody thought about that by moving this, you know, by moving the swearing in that it would affect this question of the election of the chair. I'm not sure whether that was actually considered or not. Um, so we have that. And on the other side, a longstanding process and procedure and understanding that you would ordinarily have a first meeting at which folks are sworn in and then an election of the chair. And that's just how things have gone. Um, so in court, the county, and it was, it was brought by the county counselor, uh, Beth Orwick, there's a quo warranto action, which is the special procedure you bring when you think that someone is holding an elected position that's not proper. So that suit was brought um, challenging and asking the court to decide that, um, that in fact, Lisa Clancy is the proper chair and uh, not, not the others. Um, you know, as I read it, Again, I think they've laid out the plain, you know, the sort of plain reading of the text. Um, there's a principle in the law that if you go to amend a statute or a law, in this case, the charter, uh, if you don't intentionally amend another section uh, of either the statutes or the, or the charter, then uh, you would not presume that it had been amended or changed. So that's a principle that's at play here. Another principle is how do you, how does one resolve uh, an ambiguity in a text? Uh, and I think uh, Lisa Clancy and you know, the county executive taking the position that it's really not actually that ambiguous. There's no, this is how it's written. When the charter was amended, it didn't account for this other change. And so the plain reading reads this, how there, how the other side is going to respond to that we don't know we have a scheduling order they have to answer uh on friday february 19th they have to respond uh, to the suit and the motions on february 23rd and then there's now currently a, a hearing set for february 26th so we'll see i think that they have a little bit of an uphill battle but they're represented by very capable Council, and it's going to be interesting to see what they file Friday and then also on February 23rd. The one additional point I will make, uh, and it really kind of goes back to the point I started with, which is that, you know, it's really up for legislative bodies to 
apply and interpret their own rules. The courts really kind of recognize this. And so there's Missouri case law that goes back to a challenge of some procedure that occurred at the Board of Aldermen. And there's some other cases that also get into it from around the state where courts, um, courts are very reluctant to go in and, and question what's been done by a legislative body or to you know, go into their, uh, to interpret their rules and procedure. And so, you know, I think the judge is going to be, you know, certainly going to be aware of those cases and is going to, you know, be at pains to try to come up with a resolution. But, you know, you know, I, I, I think he may have a hard time going outside of the plain reading of the text. We'll see what the, we'll see what the, uh, what the folks file the next week. Uh, so that's really interesting to have that timeline. So we, we're going to see some clarity, at least over the next two weeks uh, on this, it sounds like. Um, so what we have here is, is, is two different kinds of questions, right? We have a political question, we have a legal question. And we've, we've, we've kind of gotten a, a fact pattern from Rachel. We've gotten uh, some points about the legal question uh, from Tim. And that's very interesting in the sense that a part of what's at stake here is whether that resolution actually counted as removing the current chair. And it sounds like what you're saying is largely that's up to the council itself, whether it wants to recognize that resolution and that courts are gonna be hesitant to kind of take that, take that power to determine their rules away uh, from the council itself. Okay. I, yes, it, it, okay. and that's what does make this difficult and makes it one where naturally the body says, well, we need the courts to decide because there's actual disagreement about what happened. We've actually got ongoing disagreement about who the chair is today. Right. Whereas I don't know how many, it'll be interesting to see what cases are cited in the, okay. in the next filing. It, so it, then, it sounds to me, Tim, I kind of want to jump in here too, because what I was noticing when I was reading over the, the lawsuit with the you know disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer, is the argument is that if there is no mechanism specifically outlined to undo elections, which is what they are saying there is, there's no way to undo these chair elections, you can't do it. That the law isn't permissive in saying if it's not mentioned, you can do it. It's if it's not explicitly mentioned, you can't do it. It's it's not, uh, you can't just do it because it's not barred. You have to be specifically allowed to do it. And they're saying nothing that governs either the charter, the council rules, or where those are all silent, they default to Robert's rules of order, mention nothing about undoing the elections of leadership. And this right. is a re really important legal distinction, right, between kind of areas of law that basically say everything's allowed unless we don't, which is often the kind of law that applies to citizens, right? We They have all the freedoms unless we, by law, constrain them. But when we talk about giving authority to uh, lawmaking bodies, then it's kind of the reverse. Uh, and the, and the uh, burden of proof is to say, have you actually been given statutory uh, authority to make this decision? Does that sound, is that right? That's right. And, you know, I think that the, I mean, again, it's gonna be very interesting to see what is filed, you know, I'd also be interested in the take of what people what people's take is on the court of public opinion. Um, That's probably where 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 we should we should head next. Uh, so, Mike, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, so, we've got a little bit about the kind of fact pattern and the legal question. Um, there was clearly a decision made by leadership here, however, right? Uh, when it came to scheduling that first meeting of the year, at which by charter the uh, chair has to be selected. And based on recent charter changes, it was clear that there was going to be a lame duck seated at the table. That was happening, that was just kind of, as things move forward, that was how things were going to go. If there was a, there, as I understand it, there could have been a decision at least to postpone that meeting so that the first meeting of the year at which the charter requires there to be a vote for chair would be the one where uh, the new member Shalanda Webb was seated. So that's, and that's a political strategy decision, right? Do I take, do, do we take advantage of this, of the lame duck vote and the opportunity that's kind of before us or do we not? Uh, so I'd just like to ask you to talk about that a little bit. Okay, I was interested. Uh, 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 I was following Tim and uh, Rachel's uh, 
explanation of uh, what was going on, <clears throat> and it made uh, complete sense if you're a civilian. Uh, and then I'm thinking about it as a politician. Uh, you 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 listed all the jobs of my late middle age, but in my youth, I was a member of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen. I was alderman from the 21st Ward, and uh, so basically, all of these are political decisions. And one of the first things that you really have to to learn in politics is whatever they say it is, it ain't that. Okay, <laughs> that, that there's nothing going on with the council chair that justifies this level of existential angst. So the real question is there's obviously some underlying uh, political currents and conflict that happen to uh, make take out take the opportunity of the council chair to surface. Now, I don't know what they are, but this is not about who's the council chair, because the council chair is largely ceremonial and a presiding officer. It's not like the Speaker of the House or the, or the uh, President where, of the Board of Aldermen. Where, where you're assigning things to committee and all of that. So at that level, uh, this whole public discussion is really a charade, a charade covering something else that we don't have a have a clue. I would argue that ultimately, uh, my lay reading of, of the law relative to legislative bodies, even small ones like the county council, is that they are basically the author of their uh, governance and. Uh, you can usually do whatever you got a majority of votes for. Mitch McConnell is living proof of that every, every day. So it, it, it right, wrong, nothing, uh, 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 none of that matters if you got the votes. And uh, in this instance, uh, Lisa McClan uh, uh, Lisa Clancy had the votes on January 1st, and by January 7th, she didn't have the votes. So if I'm a judge, I would say, why you, you know, I'd be like an NBA referee. Why are you asking me to keep playing? Okay, uh, 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 I, uh, 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 I, I, I'll take a pass on that. Okay, uh, uh, four people decided one thing, and then four more people who were all legitimately council members decided something else. Why would I get in the middle of that? And I'm gonna let the last vote stand. It, it, it's stop. I think it's going to ultimately play out. All right. Uh, thank you for that. I don't think you're qualified anymore to give a lay reading, Mike, uh, but, but <laughs> I appreciate that take. Lashana, I want to come to you uh, kind of as opposed to kind of deep political insiders, right? As, as, as someone who deals directly uh, with legislative bodies as the president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association, but also as an active and engaged citizen with the interests of the city at heart, what does this say to you? What does it mean to you when you see uh, uh, legislative leadership in the region working or not working this way? Um, as a person who has a, a job where I own my own business, uh, obviously I'm paying attention as much as I can. <laughs> 40 hours a week is dedicated to my business. And you know, I try to do eight hours a night of sleeping, but we won't even talk about that when you're a business <laughs> owner. You're you're really ever never there. So, you know, what I have is that free time, you know, that extra eight hours a day where I am trying to do what I need to do and actually try to stay engaged in what's happening within my community. Uh, and that is just a personal thing. Some people decide to opt out. They're just burnt out by the end of the day and they're just like, I don't have time. So I'm coming from that perspective. Um, the other thing that I have is a little bit of experience of dealing with uh, handling some of the little uh, in intricate uh, little nuances when it comes to uh, you know, what's happening when a board shifts over, what's going on with the bylaws and things of that nature, being with the Downtown Neighborhood Association, because I joined it right in the middle of a very contentious battle about how our bylaws were written, what was in them, um, who was elected when, uh, how long people were supposed to serve. And uh, that, that kind of happened to be something that I was steeped in. And actually in October of 2019, um, our, uh, our chair of the uh, board of DNA resigned. Uh, and at that time I served as vice chair. 
So while we were going through and trying to handle all of those changes, I'm still kind of having to upscale myself. I have to learn what Robert's Rules of Order are more intently than I did before. I have to be more familiar with Missouri law when it comes to running a nonprofit organization because as vice chair, you know, I'm kind of the, the default uh, chair until we decide what to do. And then we had to ask that question, what do you do when the chair's not there anymore? You know, do you keep going? Do I step in? You know, and then they go back to saying, okay, well, what do your bylaws say? And then we have to go through that and compare that with the bylaws we're trying to change. So I kind of got thrown into this whole thing of being very, very educated in a very small period of time. Um, again, this was something that I happened to go through. So when I look at what's happening on a larger scale of um, what's happening with the city, uh, what's happening with the county, I kind of compare that to what I went through. And I say, you know, how much common sense is, is involved in this? How much of it is based off of the experience that was unique to me that I had? And how much would the average citizen be able to do all of that? <laughs> that's responsible for voting. So, you know, a part of me wants to educate. That's kind of like my background. It's like, if you don't know something, I want to educate you on it so that you can know and then decide to go your own path and choose whatever it is that you like to do. And uh, when I go there and I'm, I'm looking at the city and the county and asking, you know, are they going and asking other people? Are they, are they going and saying, hey, we're stuck at this point. Let's look at some other cities uh, or other county legislative bodies and ask them, how did you handle this exact scenario? Because believe me, that's what I had to do with DNA. I was not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, I am a, a regular average self-owned business uh, 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 entrepreneur. So I have my brain there, but I know that part of the important part of being an entrepreneur is knowing when to step forward and when to step back and went to ask questions and get expert advice and help. So then I start taking my mind and applying it to that situation and saying, are they doing that? Are they stuck at this issue and are they asking for help or is there just drama involved? So uh, that's pretty much where I am. Uh, again, I don't wanna take up all the time. Rachel, no, that, I will talk a long, long yarn. <laughs> but, no, but, I, I appreciate yeah. that uh, because I, I, the, it's, I, I don't want just the political insider viewpoint. You bring some really interesting points, which is the opaqueness of all of this that Mike uh, pointed to right uh, that 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 the headlines aren't what's actually motivating the actors uh, or what the headlines are being written about uh, is, aren't necessarily what's at stake uh, is a big problem for folks that only have time to read the headlines if that because they're trying to live their lives they're trying to build a business they're trying to do that. And the other piece of the puzzle is really bringing that kind of common sense piece to the table to say at what point does leadership have a responsibility for resolving this and moving forward instead of kind of just absolutely sitting in uh, and, and putting their foot down. So which brings us to uh, the, the obligation that they have to kind of resolve this and move forward is based on the work that they have to do, uh, right? Um, I mean, what's the, the biggest issue, of course, right now on the county government's plate is COVID response. Uh, the incredible amount of money, the incredible amount of resources, the incredible amount of need in the community um, that is out there. And uh, County Executive Page and his agenda are kind of the elephant outside of the room in the sense that Mike, uh, maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a part of this battle is an attempt to protect or make vulnerable uh, county executive pages uh, kind of broad legislative agenda. Uh, do I see that right? Uh, yeah, well, that's always in play, whether it's the mayor with the board of aldermen or the county executive with the county council or the president with the Congress. That ultimately the the, the, the everyday job of any elected executive is managing the relationship with the legislative body that has to authorize everything that you do. And in the county, this is strictly the case that uh, the, the county executive is a very powerful administrator 
but he's not a powerful executive because literally everything that the county executive does has to be authorized by the county council. Where in the city, the mayor's got, uh, it's got such a large executive branch where you throw in all the county offices that there are huge spaces, great spaces, where mayors can operate based on personality, energy, and imagination that the county executive doesn't have. So it, 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 it is a, a big difference. But unlike the city, once the county executive gets authorized, he almost has complete freedom and latitude to execute any way he wants, where the mayor can get caught up in follow up with the Board of Aldermen because it's, it's just a different co politically culture and therefore a different uh, political environment. But I would argue that some of that is in play and a more mature political judgment would have been, from my perspective, we need to make this go away. Okay, so first of all, how did we even get in the argument? Secondly, the argument don't make a hell of a lot of sense. And I need for the argument to go away. So that means somebody's got to back down. And uh, ultimately, the only thing that makes political sense is Rita the day stand at chairman because it was her turn. And she literally has got four votes now. Lisa Clancy doesn't. So the last thing you would really want to be is the chairman of the council that the judge made you the chairman. Okay, so you 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 with a three vote uh, uh, you're a three vote chairman and you got four folks regularly 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 hitting you upside the head with everything they want in, in any time they want. So it really politically it really doesn't make a lot of sense that it's fairly amateurish by amateur bat, uh, vanity more than just being politically savvy about here's how this thing, you know, it's what Joe Pesci used to tell uh, Robert De Niro and the Irishman. It's going to happen anyway, okay? So that, at that point, uh, 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 learn to live with it and then make the adjustments and, and get out. So actually, uh, and, it do, and it will play out inside of what the, the business that they have to do. And as I would argue if you're the county executive, you should make this go away one way or the other. And, and Mike, that is what has been somewhat confusing to me too. As you mentioned earlier, it's not like the chair has the legislative power that the board of aldermen president does or the speaker of the house does. They're a presiding officer. They can assign some things to committees it seems like they unnecessarily alienated someone that they may need for their agenda to advance. You know, it, it's, why would you do that for a position that really does not serve necessarily to advance the agenda? That, that was, you know, is it just a naked power move or is it, you know, I believe that I need this job too. Is it just a misunderstanding of the role of the chair? That's what didn't make sense to me from this. And I was I, hoping I, you would have the answer. No, I, 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 would, put it, I would put it like uh, 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 like this, Rachel. If, if I was uh, John Madden sitting in the booth or Tony Romo, uh, the two kind of plays in football, you can say that didn't work, but I understand what they were doing. And then there's the comment that you make that why the hell would you ever do that? Okay, I mean, that, and this falls into that category. There, there, there are things that there's a rationale for just didn't work, bad execution or somebody uh, outflanked us, and I get that because everything you do doesn't work. But then there are things that just don't make sense from a professional standpoint, and professionally speaking. This is dumb, okay? Just and that's all. And it's am it's worse than dumb. It's being an amateur in a business that requires you to be a professional. Let so I don't, I, I don't want to pass. I don't want to pass uh, uh, opinion on 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 what what has just been said. But I wanted to take us to a couple other places that I think would be of interest. Uh, uh, number one, one of the as Mike said, you know, the other key when it comes to procedure and being orderly in a deliberative body is the majority, the key principle is the majority rules. And then the other rules are there to protect the voice of the minority to make sure that there is debate and that they are heard. Um, 
So again, what would happen next year if this if this four three split holds? But I think that's that. I think how did we get to this four three split? It's very interesting, and I would I would I would mention a couple of things. One, it's not along party lines. So that's that's a, that's interesting. Two, it seems to me that uh, Council Member Trakis has had a little bit of an evolution over the past year and a half on on where he is on those on these apparent four three split. I would think Rachel and Mike uh, and Lashana might have some thoughts on that. And then thirdly, I'll I'll, I'll mention this, which is that just for to get the people's business done, there has to be a chair. As you guys have said, it's not the same as the president of the board of aldermen. It's not the same as speaker of the house, um, but there has to be a chair to run the meetings. And I did have occasion to watch a number of meetings over the past year and a half. And, um, you know, it was not clear to me that, that the chair uh, was really uh, recognized as such or, or, or treated as such. And I wonder if that's played certainly not in every meeting. And I wonder if that's played into a little bit of where we're at today. Yeah, and to bounce off of what uh, you're saying, Tim, uh, with the DNA example that I gave, uh, there wasn't a chair to run anything during that next year. Um, so uh, the, the way we have our bylaw by set December 31st, you basically end whatever elected office that you have. So the January meeting is usually run by uh, whoever is kind of residual, <laughs> residually left. So in, in a sense, so there are some lame duck members, but one of the things that we needed to decide uh, after the January meeting and after, um, before we had our first retreat, we were just like, so who's running this thing? <laughs> You know, it's like nobody has any elect, you know, all the elected officers are gone, the chair is gone, you know, we don't have any position. So we ended up deciding to have a special meeting um, that kind of recouped some of that information. And it wasn't about, I want to be in control, or I want that person to be in control. It was just like, Who's gonna run the meeting? Somebody's gotta run the retreat. Somebody's gotta have the vision. Somebody's gotta stand up there and try to you know, move us forward for at least that next year. So uh, with that, three of us got together and we just said, hey, let's have a special meeting because that, according to our bylaws at that time, three uh, current board members could choose to do that. And then we decided to elect officers just for that one special meeting. And then afterwards, whenever we did the retreat, we knew you know, who was going to lead and what position everyone had. Now, again, DNA is not the county council. DNA is not the board of aldermen, but it was something that we looked at as common sense and it wasn't about ego. I wasn't afraid if somebody hurt my feelings and didn't elect me chair. I was like, I, I have a thousand other things to do so if somebody can run this thing you know wants to better than me that's fine but at the same time I thought consciously about you know if I decided to kind of put myself out there and just say I'm going to be chair and I'm going to run this thing and then I have six or seven other people looking at me like we don't want you anywhere near an elected office position you know I, I had to think about what the repercussions would be for the entire membership for the entire organization for everyone that was involved and when I look at things like this, I ask myself, are they kind of going that path or route? Are they thinking about what the repercussions are going to be for the residents and the businesses within their, their you know, purview? Or are they just thinking about themselves? So again, I'm just kind of coming from that, you know, uh, sensible, common sense kind of perspective and saying, you know, what will I be voting for next time when that person's seat is up? Will I be thinking about something like this? Did they try to go through and actually make some critical decisions, ego aside, that was going to be best for the outcome of, of their constituency as opposed to themselves? So bring uh, bring again, bring not knowing anybody personally. <laughs> Yeah, you're thinking common sense is common. I'm, I'm it's not. <laughs> <laughs> the possibility of electing a temporary chair to actually go through a process is a really interesting one. Uh, Mike, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I just want to, okay. Tim, is that a possibility for them? Could they simply say, look, we want to, we're going to kind of bring this process back to zero. We're going to elect a temporary chair that's maybe not one of the two that are currently vying for the chair, uh, uh, have a meeting and redo this vote. Is that a possibility for them? 
Well, the rules uh, allow for uh, you to have to uh, have a presiding member at a meeting if the chair is not there. Okay. Um, okay. The counter to that is that the charter says, you know, you shall elect a chair at your and first. And their term meeting. shall be one year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, okay. there is flexibility. Okay, Mike. Yeah, uh, uh, I just want to say they are functioning. They meet every week. They conduct business. So this angst that you and this uh, 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 angst that people have about well, what are they doing? They are conducting the business. Matter of fact, they had a major meeting about the Hazelwood uh, 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 youth uh, proposal uh, that did basically, I think, a solid judgment on really rethinking that given the change in uh, COVID as well as and what that would mean. Uh, for the hotel motel tax, but the point is, they are functioning. Everything that has needed to happen has happened, and 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 I'm and, and I'm just I'll say this like this: that the problem, part of the problem is that the public kind of needs to understand that politics, all politics, is a contact sport. Okay. And sometimes it has referees and sometimes it doesn't, you know, kind of playground, you have to call your own files, but it still is functioning. So uh, 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 the fact that it doesn't look like a game that that mothers organize for preschool children uh, uh, in daycare doesn't mean it's not working. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, is they, they are executing all of the fundamental business that needs to be executed. Whether they are personally getting along or not is really irrelevant uh, uh, to the business as long as they can conduct the business. And they don't have to like each other. They don't have to know who birthday happens when. None of that is relevant to how any of this works, okay? And it just doesn't. These are not personal relationships. The political relationships, and that's all they are. Okay, period. And and that has been the surprising thing that some have noticed is even in the midst of all of this, once they get the meeting going over the objection of you know I believe that I am chair, these bills are still coming out seven to nothing. This is not right. a situation where you know we are all going to vote against something that you know the objections at least the legislation. And it's occasionally a little bit different at the Board of Aldermen, which I know we'll get into a bit. The objections to the legislation are truly on policy, or at least they seem to be on policy. It doesn't, it, it is manages not to carry over into the functioning of, of the government. And that is a really good point, Mike. They are still managing to do things. Now, if they got to a controversial issue around coronavirus, mask mandates, et cetera, who knows how that would end up playing out. You're starting to see, um, you know, the, the cooling off period uh, for former employees to take jobs with the, or former elected officials to take jobs with the county, that's beginning to heat up. And that's a little bit more of a political thing right now. But yeah, they're getting business done. And that is sort of important to, for people to kind of, to, to remember in, in a way is, you know, they are functioning. At some That's level. a little bit, that, I, I, I'm going to be very happy if we can wind up our conversation on the county council with a little bit of good news. And yeah, it does seem that they, they, they are moving forward despite this. So I'm very glad to see that. So before we uh, kind of shift gears and start looking at the city and the board of aldermen, I just want to take a moment and give folks uh, a chance to take a look at the results of our audience polling. So it looks like our audience, about half of, half of the folks in the audience weighed in. Uh, looks like we have, we, that representative sam a sample is uh, about half split between St. Louis City and St. Louis County. That group of people is when we ask them whether they are satisfied with their individual alder person or their individual county council member, they're kind of across the board. They're uh, statistically very well behaved for a very small audience uh, in terms of their uh, opinion of their individual representative. We have all the way from very satisfied to very dissatisfied. That changes, interestingly, 
when we ask them not about their individual alder person or council person, but about that body as a whole. So if you live in the county, how satisfied are you with the job the county council as a whole is doing? Uh, we have uh, five on very dissatisfied, five on neutral, three on somewhat uh, dissatisfied, one person willing to admit that they're somewhat satisfied. So it's, it's interesting that the, the opinion of the body as a whole, very different than the opinion that folks have of their own uh, uh, representative. And that spread kind of holds in the city as well uh, with folks. We have one person willing to say they're somewhat satisfied, uh, but everybody else spread across uh, neutral or uh, somewhat and very dissatisfied. So thank you uh, to the audience for that. It gives us a sense of where you all are at. Uh, for these final uh, uh, feedback, thank you for that. I'll pull some questions from that uh, toward the end of the session as well. So thank you for taking part in that screen sharing. I wanted to make sure that we heard from the audience as well. And let me go ahead and bring us back. There we go. All right, so um, that's going to push us toward our next subject, which is uh, the City Board of Aldermen. As I pointed out, there are a lot of changes coming down the pike in the city from ward reduction to new ways of electing uh, uh, folks on the Board of Aldermen, uh, as well as citywide offices. And there seem to be, uh, the Board of Aldermen seems to be reopening some questions that uh, we thought were closed, including ward reduction, uh, which they were unsuccessful at reopening. So it does look like ward reduction is going to be moving forward. Uh, but there is a big open question about the close the workhouse uh, uh, legislation and its implementation. So Rachel, I'm going to come to you first and ask you maybe an impossible question, which is, is there a way to broadly describe the dynamics of the Board of Aldermen for those who don't have the luxury of following it, uh, uh, your incredible live Twitter feed uh, on Fridays? Because uh, is it kind of possible for you to step away from your objective reporting for a moment, or maybe you don't need to, and give us a sense of how you think the Board of Aldermen is or isn't functioning at the moment? So I'm sure I'll get some pushback from Tim on this since he was a bit of in charge of, you know, trying to keep order and herd cats among 29 individuals. But in any time that you have part time citizen legislatures, which the County Council and the Board of Aldermen both arguably are, they're not the full time jobs, although they do turn out to be somewhat full time jobs. There's always a level of dysfunction. They don't have the time to, you know, get into the charter to look things up. Uh, the board is arguably understaffed. Um, I think they, you know, they just got a policy analyst. They just got a fiscal analyst. Um, so there is always kind of an underlying level of dysfunction that always ramps up in an election year, especially when aldermen are running against each other for executive positions. Uh, for example, when uh, now Mayor Krusen and President Reed were running against each other, when uh, President Reed and Kara Spencer are running against each other. And I think in some ways too, some of the virtual meeting aspect of it has contributed to it because they don't have side rooms to go and talk to each other uh, off the floor and sort of resolve differences and ask some questions. Um, and it, it, it kind of adds a level of, they, they can't go, you know, seek out except on text or, you know, on the phone as they're on the meeting. They can't go seek counsel from older people who have been there for longer to try and get things up. And, and it, it always strikes me sometimes, especially on these meetings, there is an element of, I want to have my voice heard. It, it kind of becomes theatrical in a way. Um, there's a great line in Mike Rako's book on Richard J. Daly, where he mentions the, 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 count, the city council in Chicago, where everybody has to stand up and defend their position. And once an opponent talks, a supporter has to talk and it just goes back and forth. And there are plenty of meetings where I sit there and I go, okay, you don't all have to talk, guys, you know? Like if somebody else has made the point, let them make the point. So, you know, it gets through what it needs to get through most times, but unlike the county council, they, they haven't been able to really, generally speaking, get through 
legislative processes without a degree of angst and the virtual meetings have just kind of made that worse. And I think it's just also the nature of the Board of Aldermen. It's 28 versus seven. Um, they are more directly representative of more people. Remember the county council's authority and the county department's authority is less because of all of the municipalities, whereas the city is directly responsible for all of those 300,000 plus residents. But it, it's, you know, it's dysfunctional. It's a machine. Um, on some good days, it's well oiled. On most days, it is not. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um... And, you know, your point about uh, the virtual meetings is really, really uh, one that, that we hadn't thought or talked about yet, is that does significantly, given that meetings are about personal relationships, and if you've been at a board of aldermen or a committee hearing, and you watch them walk away and have conversations and come back, and you know that's where a lot of the work is being done, that, that element isn't there anymore. That's absolutely right. So Lashana, I'm gonna to come to you next. Um, I know as president of the DNA, you have to coordinate with a number of, of alders uh, that touch, uh, whose wards touch your neighborhood. I also know you're a part of an effort to reform the way that wards are drawn in, in St. Louis. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the board of aldermen and maybe also, uh, especially your recent experience with those with virtual meetings and if that's, if that's made a difference in how you're dealing with them and how that's influenced your interest in reform? Yeah, absolutely. Um, getting a chance to sit down and talk to the older persons uh, for downtown, which actually uh, a surprise to many people is that there are four uh, older persons for downtown St. Louis. And just a reminder that downtown St. Louis has about 10,000 residents. So <laughs> uh, as the chair of uh, DNA, one of the things I remind people is one, um, none of our elected officials live in downtown. Uh, that is not a slight at, at any point. It's just a realization point. Um, so in order to kind of communicate with those people, um, I joke and say sometimes I'm the only elected official in downtown <laughs> because I'm elected by the people of downtown. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, people look at me with responsibility. And one of the things that, uh, uh, yes, Rachel, uh, one of the things that, um, I, I uh, experienced, which m most people don't know because I didn't really talk about it very much unless you follow me on Facebook, is that when uh, the arrest happened and the 7-Eleven was on fire uh, here in downtown, people were contacting us saying, I can't get to the police. I can't get to 911. Lashana, you know, DNA, what do we do? And that puts a completely different face on the responsibility uh, of, of what it feels like to have people look at you as a leader and as a point person to help them. Um, so when I talk to these older persons, I'm like, look, you know, yes, I am average Jane citizen, but at the same time, because of the uniqueness and, uh, of the way that downtown is put together, uh, I need to talk to you on a level of, you know, a, a miniature older person, if, if you, uh, so to speak, about things, uh, because I have to work with not only that, but at the time, Downtown St. Louis, Inc., which is now wrapped into Greater St. Louis. Uh, so, you know, to be able to kind of talk to them and say, you know, it's very important that we have very efficient processes uh, as much as possible when we're dealing with downtown and the uniqueness of having a national park as your front yard, stadiums in your backyard, and then residents, small businesses, and large corporations all wrapped up into your neighborhood puts you in a very unique position to be able to talk on various different levels. And if you can't do that, you're not gonna get the cooperation you need for things to be successful, as well as talking to the seat of the city government is right here in downtown St. Louis. So one of the things that I, I try to remind uh, some of the older persons is that I am more than willing to work and get you the connections that you need in order to help the residents of downtown. Um, but also, for instance, I was talking to Christina and Gracia, and she has nine neighborhoods that she has to walk through and, and take care of. So I'm like, Christine, I know you can't just focus on downtown, even though I would love for you to, <laughs> but I understand the reality of it. So it's kind of that give and take. And one of the things that I try to, re to remind people is that, you know, 
I don't expect everyone to be able to handle something like this. I don't expect this to be the average, average Jane citizen. Most of them are working 40 hour work weeks for somebody else. Um, but in order to do something of this nature and, and to be involved, someone needs to step up and actually take the seat because otherwise things do tend to get uh, focused in the wrong direction and uh, services might be dropping downtown that we actually don't need <laughs> as residents. And that has happened from time to time. And you know that's where the phone calls happen and the emails and, and, and the reputation. And I know we were talking a bit about you know, as long as things are getting done. And uh, I, I, I love that idea, that is very great. But at the same time, reputation carries a very, very heavy price here in St. Louis. Um, and the more marginalized you are, the more your reputation matters. Uh, and I check off three boxes, black, queer, and female. <laughs> so um, my reputation has to be up there, you know, versus a, maybe a white male conservative person. Um, but it's the only way to, in order to get things done. So the various different realities that we have to live in is something that I keep trying to remind people is like, yes, do your alder person thing, but at the same time, understand that you also need a voice of the residents to be able to help, a voice of the business owners to be able to help guide you so that you are kind of giving solutions that are gonna be more applicable as opposed to maybe just best practices you saw here or there and then just plopping them down and seeing if they work. So that's why I got involved in uh, Show Me Integrity because that's kind of one of the things that we're talking about. Sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, and for those who are wondering, it's the 5th, 6th, 7th and 19th that come together in, in downtown. So there are awards that are very centered in very different places that are all representing downtown. Downtown is not the center of a ward. You might think it is, but it's not. So uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, that perspective, Lashana, and you brought up something that I that I that really resonated, which was reputation is uh, carries a heavy price here in St. Louis. Um, for a lot of folks that look at the board of aldermen, it feels like much of it is about personal rancor, uh, personal reputation, personal alliances, and uh, Mike Jones. Given that, uh, given those dynamics. Um, just like to ask you, look, moving forward, if we if we bring a new mayor to the table, uh, what advice might you give a new mayor in terms of legislative uh, strategy, uh, thinking about uh, how to make this a little more functional moving forward, right? Uh, ward reduction isn't gonna happen immediately. We're, we're not gonna get a new board of aldermen until 2023. Uh, although we'll have a we'll have a switch up this year with the elections in March and April. So what given that they still have that full set of 28, what advice might you give an incoming mayor? Uh, first of all, I want to uh, go back to some what Rachel said and, and that is uh, not having formal meetings in place that I, I, I said earlier that uh, Politics is like a contact sport, but it's also a relationship business. And having been a member of the Board of Aldermen, having been Chief of Staff, Deputy Mayor, that basically uh, the speeches are for uh, the, the great Charlie Rangel, so that's a tribute to him anyway, about the, the end of a meeting when he says, well, everything has, that needs to be said has been said, but not by everybody. And I've been through sessions with the Board of Aldermen for her everybody has to take their turn to speak. But the point is, it's that uh, uh, the ability to have proximity to folks and work through relationships and have things. And that's why literally most of the business happens off the floor while the session is actually going on. And that's, and that's part of the course of any legislative body. What I would say to any new mayor is that basically, managing the relationship with the Board of Aldermen is, is an essential part of the job. But you bring that relationship with you into the office. I mean, you're not, I mean, I mean, there's, there's no formal thing that basically you're dealing with people you've dealt with before and fundamentally the kind of relationship you got with them uh, uh, going into the office is the one you'll start with. If just at a tactical level, which is what I think you asked me, uh, that's where I'm going to interpret it anyway. The key to being successful 
is having a cohort, and, and I'd like Kim to comment on this because she spent a lot of time down there, uh, uh, having eight to 10 aldermen that the mayor can say, these are my guys, okay? That, that I got a presumption that I got eight to start with, maybe 10, which means I'm only looking for five or seven out the next 18 or 20. And that's, that's a big difference then having eight or nine people against you when you start, and then you got to get 15 out of 10. That's, the, that, that's a bigger political uh, challenge. And the interesting thing about the momentum of building votes in the legislative body, if I start with eight or 10, I can probably, I'm going to get to 15. If I get to 15, I'm going to pick up three more because uh, that's going to give me 18 to 19, let's say, because there's nobody that wants to vote on the losing side of a bill for no particular reason. If I get to 20, I'm probably going to get 22 or 23. And then all of a sudden, I'm a mayor with 20, 23 votes every week. And and, and, and that's how you build a, a political presence and a constituency, but it starts with a foundation of having some folks that for their own political reasons want you to be politically successful. And I, uh, I wrote a column last week about the mayor's race and I made the distinction between being a good mayor and a successful mayor, okay? Mm -hmm. that you can be a good person doing the right thing and fail miserably. And there are people who are not very good people or not particularly bright, they just wear it out because they got political skills and, and the temperament that you actually have to have for the job. So to, to be totally successful, it's a combination of doing the right thing and then understanding the skill set that you need to actually execute. So you need to you need to have the right motivations and then the shark-like political instincts to actually push them through. Okay. Right. Tim, you've been uh, the, the clerk and counsel for the Board of Aldermen. Uh, you know, if moving forward, uh, we'd like to see a, a little more uh, kind of easier, less dysfunctional, less theatrical version of the board. Uh, and if it's those two folks that they generally kind of ask questions about process, do you have any advice you would give the uh, Board of Aldermen on how, uh, on how to kind of maybe uh, uh, work a little better moving forward. Mike pointed to the fact that factionalism is always a, is always a feature, right? Uh, that the mayor might have a one one kind of core set of supporters that they know they can count on. Uh, there's all there might be a, a just as as uh, uh, set a core of opposition on the other side and some folks in the middle. Uh, so given that very oppositional nature of democracy. How might you recommend uh, some some uh, you know advancing some collaboration and cooperation on the board of aldermen? Well, I, I would I would urge uh, individual aldermen to think uh, about where they are vis-a-vis uh, -vis the board. I, I think the past six years has been a period of transition at the board. Uh, I, I think Mike and Rachel and Shauna can certainly speak to this. Um, traditional factions that existed uh, are not there. Um, we've had turnover. We have a sort of progressive wing, but uh, it is not easy to predict where they would be on any given issue, you know, de depending on the issue. So there are not voting blocks the way there once were. Uh, I've observed it over the past couple of years, the, uh, the Black Caucus, which uh, has sort of waxed and waned as far as organization and how often they get together is, uh, is, is waxing, is getting sort of more organized and more unified. Um, and I think that, I think that legislative bodies uh, can, can often work a little bit better if there are larger kind of factions, because you can get to the deals and you can get to the compromise a little bit faster. If you have more groups it's, it's, it, it becomes kind of harder. So I think that's one of the things that's at play. Um, um, you, know, you know, to the point uh, that Rachel made about the county council, you know, a lot of bills are still coming out seven to zero at the county council. There's still a lot of bills that are coming out with heavy majorities at the board of aldermen. And so another observation I would make 
just kind of as a citizen, but also having watched the process is, I really do think that if you took these folks and put them in the room and gave them all the same information, uh, and you gave them vote, electronic voting buttons, uh, they would agree, you know, 90% of them would agree on the right, the right path uh, on most issues. But there, is, but there, but there on, on many issues, but there's a lot of, you know, I think there's information um, imbalances. I don't think everybody has quite the same information. Uh, and some people think that that's, some people, some, I think some members like that. They think that gives them an edge. Um, but, you know, I think as we cut down to 14, I think that the chances of it becoming a little bit more rational and a little, meaning a little bit easier to predict and a little bit easier for people to forge alliances. I think that that's very, I think that we may see that. Uh, 28 is, is a heck of a number um, to try to forge, you know, a majority from. So thank you. The other, the other thing that's, that's um, the other thing that's pressing on the alderman now is as we move from 28 to 14, um, you know, there's, there's some people call it two roles. I might say it's three for the alderman as we're currently constituted. One is uh, setting policy, uh, you know, the sort of capital P political concerns, including the budget, okay? Number two is uh, government oversight, which is something they do, you know, that they, you know, they engage in to varying extents. And then three is constituent services. These, many of these aldermen are the point of contact for people when they have a service issue. And that has traditionally been the case. And most of the aldermen, when you talk to them, they recognize that if we go to a smaller board, you know, this constituent services part, where we're really talking about government services, this needs to be probably taken over more by an executive branch. This isn't something that they should be spending their, as much time on. So I think there are movements afoot and discussion about how that gets done, um, you know, how do you structure that? I think that's something they're going to be looking at quite a bit over the next 10 years. So that brings uh, uh, maybe yeah. a fourth role into the aldermen, right? Because they control their own process to a certain degree. Well, that's right. They, they may be drawing those 14 districts, right? According to the yes. current process, they draw their own districts coming up. So they have a lot of control over their own process going forward, which might add to that, that burden that they have. Mike, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I, I, I just want to want to say that 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 has been what Tim just raised about the constituent service has been a forever battle on the board of aldermen. I I remember as a young alderman, literally a hundred years ago, nineteen eighty one, uh, uh, I thought constituent services was a pain in the butt. I I, I wanted to be a, in a legislative body for policy and legislative reasons. And I would have outsourced all of it to the executive branch, come up with citizen service bureaus, et cetera. Yet there was a large cohort of aldermen then that didn't want to do that because their political base was their constituent services. So it depends on why you came to the Board of Aldermen, how you got there, that will frame how you actually see the issue. I agree with Tim, they're shrinking the number will probably make the politics easier. And I would argue the reverse is needed in a county council, that you probably need a bigger council because with seven, one person is everything. In, in, a, in a seven person, I mean, you, you three to three, one person decides uh, uh, where everything ends up. And if you had a larger number of them, four million people of around 11 or 13, you picked a number, you'd have some fluidity in, 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 in that environment and the opportunity for coalitions to be a little bit more mobile and, and, and flexible. Yeah. Go ahead, Lashana. I was gonna say that was another thing that, you know, I, I've talked uh, to other people about and actually having a lot of one-on-ones with all the persons is that, you know, they don't have any staff. They don't have anybody helping them do these things. Uh, I thought for a long time, alder persons were full-time 
uh, you know, employees of the city and they had a staff of two or three, you know, um, basically kind of like a, a, a miniature congressperson. But it was, it's not that. It's, it's a person who, you know, has a full-time job doing something else, part-time, you know, they happen to be an older person and then they have to, you know, squirrel away some money if they want to try to hire someone to be an assistant to help them out with certain things. And I was just like, that is a lot. And it's not like, you know, you're just running your small mom and pop. It's you're handling the services of residents and human beings, you know, for for an entire city or, you know, portion one one twenty eighth of a city. So that's, you know, a very heavy load to put on someone. And um, I think it, 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 it needs to be said that I understand the challenges that older people face. Um, it's just that I really wish that there was a lot more transparency uh, and education uh, to, out to you know the general citizenry to say, this is what happens, this is how this works, this is how this is set up. Um, so when you're voting for someone, understand that you're voting them into a part-time job <laughs> where they will have no staff, but they will have all these responsibilities and they have to get all of this done. Uh, so, uh, and their budget is probably not going to be what you think it is. Yes. So uh, to, to kind of wrap all of that up, just from a, you know, plain layperson perspective, since Mike can no longer do layperson, uh, I, I'll do the, the layperson. <laughs> And also, too, that kind of gets to, you know, and what could change, especially going to 14 or to, yeah, the 14, there just needs to be better support services. And I don't mean just for the aldermen, you know, it would be incredibly helpful if they had policy analysts that they could go to, that they had their own assistant. They share secretaries at the board. They answer the call, do mail, et cetera. They don't have a, they have a policy person, but also just for residents as well, you know, in a functioning city, you shouldn't have to call your older person to say, hey, can you get the sinkhole in the alley fixed? It looks like it's about to eat a car. Um, you know, and, and there's been some great reporting on the disparities of response to CSB calls in terms of where in the city the calls are answered more, that Citizen Service Bureau. Um, you know, just, just supporting the aldermen and doing their job and then supporting the constituent service side of things so that the first call isn't to the alders. And I completely agree with, with Mike that there are some aldermen and alder women who are just there because they're like, I want to feel important. I want to feel those calls. But there is a growing faction at the board that is emphasizing that big P political part of it and really wanting to shape policy and change the direction of the city. And that's, I think, the fundamental tension is between kind of those two factions right now. And, you know, if you give more constituent services support in the executive branch, CSB, et cetera, you know, really make that functional, you know, I think you really could, you know, you'd have aldermen who will, and alder women, alders, I guess, who would focus on and have the time to focus more on the policy side of things. And so I, uh, I want to make sure we get a few questions from the audience in here. Um, but I also want to uh, give a shout out um, uh, based on our conversation and knowing how difficult these legislative jobs are and how little time and energy they have. I just want to give recognition. We have a couple of alders who have joined us uh, in the audience tonight. Uh, I, I know Annie Rice was here earlier and it looks like Pam Boyd is still here. I just want to acknowledge uh, their service and they're showing up today. We appreciate that. And I want to point, uh, Lashana, I want to point you to the questions. Uh, someone's asking, do you utilize the neighborhood improvement specialists for the ward downtown? Absolutely. Um, okay. I, I think our Maria is, is uh, one for one portion of downtown, but I, I remind people downtown is split up. <laughs> so I'm not contacting one person for one position. I'm usually contacting three people that fit a position. Um, but in addition to that, I try to stay in contact with all of the other people, uh, as well as our state reps. And, uh, you know, it, it, every now and then we may have a special guest com come and pop up uh, that's from a larger governmental entity. But uh, one of the things that DNA is really good with is making sure we extend an invite to all of our elected officials that touch downtown in some way to make sure that they can hear from the downtown residents and, and we can hear from them. And most of them do 
uh, usually come on a regular basis. I know Rasheen and Lakeisha tend to be off in, in Jeff City every now and then, but they even call from their cars and we appreciate uh, doing that. So yeah, we try to stay in contact. Plus we invite uh, the captain uh, of, I think it's District 4, police captain, uh, which used to be Renee Creesman, who has now been promoted to major. Uh, so we have uh, Brent Feig, uh, who is the new captain, and he comes and he gives a report every uh, single meeting that we have. So yeah, we try to stay in contact with all of our representatives uh, to make sure that we have a good relationship with them. And I want to I want to emphasize something, Lashana, here, which is you know we we can all complain about elected officials. Uh, but as a public ethicist, I am going to turn around and lay a lot of this blame right back at voters' uh, feet, right? And what you're showing us here, Lashana, is kind of a model of citizen engagement. You don't have to be the president of your neighborhood association, but be there, show up, ask questions, uh, do the work. Uh, le legislators can't do this work uh, in a vacuum. So uh, one other question from uh, the audience here. Uh, given the state of the Board of Aldermen and its reduction to come, what role do you feel the new mayor would have in bringing the city together? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in on that. I, I think, uh, and, and again, I'm a, I'm a practitioner that uh, spent my life as a practitioner that now since I'm retired, I think about it. Uh, more than I actually thought about it while I was doing it. And and there's a bureaucracy that runs the city. I mean, the day-to-day the, the, the -day execution, it's like there's a bureaucracy that runs the county. So the real job of any mayor is really trying to create a, having an idea about where you think the city needs to go. Creating that vision and then mobilizing and organizing enough people who want to go in that direction with you. Part of getting that done is having an effective relationship with the legislative body that has to authorize what you do, no matter what the size is. It could be 14, it could be 28, it doesn't matter, it could be seven. But you have to figure that out. And the one thing a mayor doesn't get to say is, well, they don't like me, they're too hard to work with. That's the job, okay? You're, you're, you're the person that does not, you're like the captain of the ship. You don't have an excuse for the boat sinking, okay? That if the, if the ship sinks, the captain's fired, period. It could be a hurricane, iceberg, it doesn't matter. That's the job you sign up for and you don't get to make an excuse about when it doesn't work. You just gotta fig keep figuring it out it out and that is the challenge and 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 you really have to figure it out every day because whatever plan you thought you had i'll tell anybody will disappear the first day you sit down because all of, everything you're going to be confronted with is none of the things that you planned or expected but they are the things you're going to have to successfully deal with and that's the reality of the job, and then you got to explain it to people in a way that they can give you what I call informed consent, okay? That they're not doing it because you said so, they're doing it, they're saying yes because they understand enough of what you're trying to get done to see how it's in their interest, and therefore they are supporting you. And the reason that's critical is that's how you get the benefit of the doubt when they're not sure, okay? That they don't. They're not the subject matter expert you are. So the question is, why do I, why am I going to run this play? It's because Coach says so, and I think he knows what he's doing, or she knows what he's doing. And that's really the nature of the job. And if you don't understand that, or you take too long to learn that, you're going to have a difficult time being successful. I think at a really practical level, um, you know, bringing the city together over the maps, if they stick with the process as it's outlined right now, which is the Board of Aldermen draws their own maps, there may be some discussion about citizen commissions. I know that's part of what Lashana's group is looking for is to reform a little bit how those maps are drawn. But, you know, the mayor is one of the two citywide elected officials who would have a say in how those maps are drawn. The other one is obviously president of the Board of Aldermen in terms of his or her convening role and getting the alders to the table. 
you know, use your leverage in that. Use the position that you have to say, this is what I'm looking for in maps. You know, I will veto or I will not support something that doesn't look like this. Go out into the city and, you know, explain what it is that you want in those maps and show people that you have a vested interest in hearing what they want. You know, if the process doesn't change, you have some authority there to put pressure on the board of aldermen and, and set your agenda. Getting to 20 is tough, especially on maps at the board of aldermen. And, you know, can you use the fact that you are a citywide official to to shape those, to you know, to shape the map and to say, you know, this is what I will support support and not support and, and lay that position out. You know, again, you're going to have half of the people mad at you because they didn't vote for you or they wanted the other map, but at least you've shown the willingness to listen and to lay down some markers. Uh, Rachel, let me uh, 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 kind of counterpoint to that. Uh, people presume that the mayor has a lot of influence on redistricting. And I'm speaking as a member of the Board of Autumn who's gone through uh, redistricting. The American has zero. I mean, literally, I was on the board of Alderman that took the map away from the mayor. And we actually drew the map. And we started with consolidating 11 votes on the automatic Black Hawkers. And we drew a map for North St. Louis with 11 wards. And then we said to our white colleagues on the rest of the board of Alderman, our map stops at Market Street, Highway 40, and we'll do a map with the first four guys that get or the first nine that 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 connect us at, at Market Street. Now, literally by the time Vince Shamer, who was the mayor at the time, decided to get into it, we already had 20 votes or 23 votes for a for a map that everybody could live with, by the way. Now the reality is in redistricting, there's gonna be at least one, if not two wars that always get screwed because you still got to reconfigure a map and you can't put it back together exactly like it was. And, 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 and when you try to make those pieces come together, somebody is going to be disadvantaged. So the, and, I, and I'll be honest, it's the politically weakest amongst some popular person on the board of Alderman who will usually get the bill for putting uh, a map together. And that's just the reality of it. And oh. then people go on, okay? Because you go live with the map for 10 years, you'll be mad about it for six months or maybe a year after the first ele round of elections, when it all changes, nobody ever even talks about it. So we don't got, make more out of it than it really is. We've got just a minute, a couple of minutes left. Uh, Lashana, you got mentioned. Uh, and I want to point out that like one of the things about maps that they're supposed to do is preserve communities of interest, right? That's one of the core pieces. And Lashana, you've been talking about the fact that downtown as a community of interest is divided. So right. you're looking at uh, some different ways of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, redistricting. And for full disclosure, I'm a board member of Show Me Integrity, so I, I don't want anybody to, to I want everybody to know that. Uh, but just I want to hear, Lashana, uh, what because we district the next redistricting isn't just a new 28 we're gonna it's a game of of musical chairs where half the chairs have been taken away right so it's going to be right. more brutal than ever uh so lashana you want to talk a little bit about what you're what you're working on yeah actually um just to, for a clarification point uh, rachel i know you didn't mean mean this when you said my organization, but people keep thinking that I run different organizations. I do not run Show Me Integrity. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I am I, I'm not needing to put any more responsibility <laughs> or power on you than you want. It's the people will contact that you are a me. part of. Um, yes, a part yeah. of. I do <laughs> not an run advocate it. Advocate for and a supporter <laughs> of, but not not the yes. not the person <laughs> with Show Me Integrity. <laughs> Right. I was like, I only run my consulting business. That's it. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, interested me and in showed me integrity was the, the look at redistricting and war reduction. Um, and then it's coming from this common sense model again. Uh, with redistricting, we were saying, you know, would an independent citizen commission make more sense to be involved with uh, redrawing the maps? 
uh, the districts. And it was just something that we decided to kind of throw around, ask questions, find out more information about. It wasn't one of those things where it's like, this is what we want. It was like, does it make sense? Is it something that could be a plausible alternative? Uh, another thing that we talked about with the award reduction is like, okay, well, what are the repercussions of that? And what are some things that we might want to ask for? If we're going from 28 to 14, all the persons, can we move them from part-time to full-time and uh, make that, that change as well as get staff for them? Is that something that is a common sense approach that we could some way find out a way to legalize it? Again, I'm not a lawyer, but to figure out a way legally that would make the most sense and make it a plausible alternative uh, and then allow people to vote on that and people to put in their input. And that's why Show Me Integrity um, organizing committee kind of uh, spear, spear uh, led uh, the survey that just went out that ended about February 14th, where we asked people, you're like, what do you think about these uh, particular possible policies? Are you okay with it? Do you have comments on it? And then uh, we were only expecting maybe 250 people to answer it and we gave people 14 days, we ended up getting 250 people in I think about a week. Uh, so we just kept it, you know, kept it going. At the end, it was almost 400 people who responded <clears throat> just to that survey. We also did polling so that we could account for a, a balance where we understood that um, demographically, we were not gonna have all the answers we wanted to through a survey model. So we had a, a polling uh, third party uh, come in and actually uh, do you know their polling thing where they call people and ask them questions and things like that uh, and specify that we wanted a, a, an oversampling of the black population in particular because we knew that that would be the population that would probably not have the biggest representation in a, a, a blanket survey model. So one of the things we did was we asked these questions and we went out there and we said, you know, these things will affect you in, in the long run, even if it's not directly immediately after an election or after a ballot measure, it will still affect you in some sort of way. And we think that you should be educated and aware of how these things affect you and then be able to make a, um, an educated decision based off, the, off of that. So again, the whole thing is about education. I don't care if you decide I hate war reduction. I don't want to do that. I hate, you know, uh, the, the, having to have any responsibility independently. I don't want to do that. If that's your decision, that's your decision. But you should at least be able to come from it from an educated level, as opposed to something that is pushed one way or the other. So one of the things I did like about Show Me Integrity is that it's a heavy emphasis on education, and then allowing you to have a voice and being able to. Uh, show me type was able to create some policies with very uh, advanced people, more advanced than me uh, in the political realm to be able to come with that. And again, this is me as a person who is not a politician. I am not running for office. Don't, uh, so, so please don't start that rumor. <laughs> I'm not running for any office. I am just a person who happens to be in a situation where I'm able to kind of tie these lines. Uh, but I always tell people, educate yourself first before you just jump and make an assumption or jump and make a conclusion about something. And I have always been about that, even as a self-taught uh, technologist. Uh, it's, it's all about education and continual education. Thank you. And I think that's actually a really powerful note to end on because we are out of time and I want to respect everybody's time. Again, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists and our attendees for being here today. Um, I learned a lot. I hope there was some, uh, some clarifying for the audience. I really, really I want to thank Rachel Lippin, Mike Jones, Tim O'Connell, Lashana Lewis for sharing your expertise and your time today. Very much appreciate it. Uh, with that, uh, thank you to everybody. I'll let you go to have the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>